And welcome everyone to the first episode of Broadcaster Hour. This is Roger Hoover with you from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And who's that on the other side of the screen? That is Kyle Crooks here from the swamp, Gainesville, Florida. As you can see, I got Florida across my chest. I have a beautiful setup, Roger, by the way. I got my, my light here on the top of a suitcase. I got my laptop on a shoebox. I mean, if you looked at this setup right now, if you really pulled the curtain back and you had the behind the scenes, it's something special. It really is a tech specialty that I put together here. Yeah, I'm kind of similar. I got a stack of books, the laptops on top of that. Got a light with no shade on it right behind the laptop. I've uh, got the Eddie Lacy print. You got the picture. Yeah, it's not mine, but it's been a good backdrop for some of these live interviews I've been doing uh, through the Crimson Tide Sports Network during this uh, coronavirus hiatus. And we certainly hope everyone is staying healthy and sheltering in place, just uh, listening to their government officials on the right thing to do at this time. But Kyle, it's kind of brought us to a very strange time for us because typically you and I are extremely busy at this time of the year yeah it's a, it's a really really tough time because at this time of the year every day roger i find myself looking at the softball schedule um so i, I do florida women's basketball florida softball and florida soccer i do a lot of the sec network plus stuff here in gainesville with the university of florida and every day i look at the schedule and be like oh we were supposed to be at ucf today or we were supposed to be at tennessee for a three game series a series that you were supposed to be doing yep. for sec network plus and i was going to do on the radio so every day i kind of look at the schedule and be like oh this is where i was supposed to be and and it, in a way it is a depressing thing but you put everything into perspective right you know it's this is a small price to play uh, to pay for the greater good you know the the public health so it's it's an odd situation it's a situation that only happens what once every 100 years right so uh you just have to kind of go through it and this is the time right roger that you you try to find inventive ways to get better so um i'm sure you you kind of do some of the same things to to utilize this off time you 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 watch old games, you, you listen to old tape, hours and hours of old tape. You go back to maybe two years ago and be like, wow, why did I sound like that? <laughs> why did I say this at this point? And you go back to old tapes and, and this is really the time to find ways to, it, it's odd to be doing that in March and, and early April to to look back at the year and see how it went. Because like you said, this is really the grind of the year, but this is a, there are different ways that you can find ways to get better. And I know, Roger, you're probably doing the same thing. Yeah, I certainly am. And, you know, typically that time for me would always be, you know, September, October was always kind of my light schedule before I got uh, a little more involved in Alabama's coverage of football here in Tuscaloosa uh, because the minor league baseball season would just end. You take a deep breath, kind of don't do anything for a little bit. You always kind of need that week to recharge. And for me, this has always just felt like uh, what's happened a couple times in my minor league seasons uh, in Jacksonville. We had seasons end prematurely due to a hurricane. So you kind of take the weekend, it's kind of an unexpected thing, get to see your friends and family for a little bit, but then there's always a game kind of coming right back after it. So that's what's made this time so different is that it is certainly you and I don't know the next game we're going to get to broadcast. We're hoping that it can be this fall because just uh, you were both, as you mentioned, you broadcast women's basketball, soccer, softball for the University of Florida. I'm at the University of Alabama as the play-by-play uh, -play broadcaster for Alabama women's basketball, and then I'm involved as well in the pre- and post-game shows for Alabama football and men's basketball plus the SEC Network Plus games. So you and I are college broadcasters, and we thrive on having a full campus, uh, full of life, full of games, and a lot of uh, opportunities to work. But it's just been different what we've seen the last few weeks. Yeah, it certainly is. And, and you try to find ways to to kind of rekindle some of those memories and some of those memories that you had during the year. And, and I think back to my final game, Roger, before all this hit. And it was the same day when the Rudy Gobert news came out. He tested positive for coronavirus, and that was when sports shut down. That's when everything went kaput. And it was a Florida-Florida State softball game on SEC Network Plus, and that was the last game that we got to call. And we kind of heard rubblings that, this was going to happen. Florida softball was getting set to have a three-game series against Baylor that weekend, and it was already set. There was going to be no crowd. There were going to be no fans in the stands. We were going to be there. We were going to broadcast the game. These people still got to see the game, but immediate family, uh, staff, they were going to be there for the, for the game. And then once the Rudy Gobert stuff happened and the NBA shut down their season, 
that was the end of it all. Everything, every sports that are dropping like flies, right? You were at, and I think it's a good story that people could hear is when you were at the SEC men's basketball tournament and, and in that building, but everything just started to, to fall apart sports wise again for the greater good. But I think that that great story that you had about being in Nashville, being at the SEC men's basketball tournament is one that I'm sure people would enjoy hearing. Yeah, it certainly was a strange 24 hours. Uh, you know, first of all, you kept seeing all the news of different. I think the Ivy League was the first to completely cancel their tournament. Um, and then there was still the ACC tournament. And then on Wednesday, uh, the SEC tournament got going and played the first two games in Nashville on that Wednesday night. And it was kind of eerie driving to Nashville. Even that Wednesday, you're thinking, well, are we really going to be able to play? play this and then they did have fans for those two games that night and I was out to dinner with the uh, voice of the Vols Bob Kessling one of my great mentors someone we hope to have uh, on this show coming up moving forward and just the news kept trickling in and it started with the NBA with Rudy Gobert and then all of a sudden you know that game is canceled games and then the NBA suspended its season we went from them getting ready to play that game to the NBA suspending the season in the time that Bob and I were at dinner and then we heard the SEC tournament the next day Tennessee is playing Alabama we heard that they were going to have no fans in the stands similar measures to what you were talking about coming up for Florida softball so it was interesting on Thursday morning Alabama Tennessee was going to be the first game of the day and because I believe Texas A&M was the first team that practiced and then Kentucky was the next team that got to practice at Bridgestone Arena. Uh, For the longest time, myself, a lot of other media members were not allowed to come in to Bridgestone and set up um, our equipment. Our equipment was already set up by our engineer, Tom Stipe, but we weren't able to kind of get in our seats and get ready for our pregame show, which for Alabama men's basketball is an hour. But we were able to come in. Kentucky's practice uh, started to wind down at about 1045 uh, Central Time in the morning and started to sit down, open up the laptop, got connected to the internet, and basically right as I did that with TweetDeck in the corner of my screen, like I always have it, I see the tweet from the SEC that says this tournament has been suspended just as we were about 10 yeah. minutes from going on the air uh, thinking it was going to be kind of a weird game anyway between Alabama and Tennessee and then three others after that the rest of the day in the tournament um, but gosh it was just surreal and we were able to go on the air for about 10 minutes update Alabama fans on what was going to be next uh, it was a little interesting inside Bridgestone Arena they played a so long farewell from the sound of music kind of as a <laughs> symbol that it was all over but it was a kind of surreal feeling because you had uh, you know, not only us, but the Vol Network with Tennessee, you had ESPN's personnel, all just with the same kind of stunned look on their face, and all of us kind of thinking, all right, let's get out of Nashville. Let's get, because Vanderbilt was one of the first schools in the league that completely uh, shut down classes and started to keep their campus off limits and things like that. So it was a little weird going to Nashville knowing that anyway, but Mm -hmm. uh, gosh, you know, for that to happen. And then we get the news later in the day that no NCAA tournament and then softball and baseball, which you and I call a lot of that canceled as well. I think that was probably the most shocking part of the day for me. Looking back at that Thursday, March 12th was, you know, events that we're used to in June, like the women's college world series and the men's college world series already being canceled. That was the toughest part for me that day, just knowing how, how long we still had to go and it still feels like a long way away anyway as we talk on april 10th yeah and even the sec they had canceled their regular season schedule through march 30th at that time but the women's college world series and the world series for baseball that was already canceled so mm-hmm. you, you start to think to yourself well if they do come back to play and you're holding out hope because again a lot of us don't know everything about this virus we don't we didn't really know how quickly this was going to change things we, we still thought okay well if we can get to march 30th and we get the okay we can we can still play some games and now you, you laugh at that notion at this yeah. point in time but yeah, that was the most shocking thing, and there was a there was a lot of visceral reaction on Twitter, and that's what Twitter is, right? Yeah. Once you once you see, I'm glad that, I didn't tweet much that day. Looking back, <laughs> I, I'm very glad I kind of kept silent. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm lucky I kept silent too. I, I usually I'm, a, I'm an observer on Twitter more than a, a big time tweeter, uh, but um, yeah, that that was that was a shocking thing because when, and you think of it from our perspective, it's frustrating. But how about from a student athlete? perspective right and and now we know that they get the extra year of eligibility if they decide to come back and that's going to be a whole cluster in itself right what are the coaches going to do and scholarship wise and roster number why how's how's that all going to work 
And, um, it, but that was, that was the most frustrating thing. And now as we continue to progress in this whole thing, you mentioned it before about the fall schedule, because you just look at college budgets, right? Everything is, is centered around college football. That That's not any hidden secret. So I, I read something the other day, they're going to try whatever they can to make sure they play college football. And we can have an interesting and looking at it from a, through the broadcaster lens, right? We could have we always talk about crossover season with with football and basketball. You're going to have an even bigger, I think, crossover season this year because you're going to have I think football starting later. I mean, we could have football starting in October maybe, and then you're having that long period of of crossover of football, basketball. You have the Masters that are going to be played in November, right? You have the U.S. Open that's going to be played in the fall. So we're going through this now, but. You know, and especially for all the, the freelance broadcasters mm-hmm. out there who are going through this struggle right now of not having work and, and not getting that influx of cash. And hopefully, you know, we just get through it because once we do get through it, there's going to be just more than enough to go around in terms of sporting events, games to broadcast. But this is this is really a tough time for. Uh, and again, since we're, we're taking this from a broadcaster perspective, right? Right. Um, this is a tough time. You really feel for you know the freelancers and independent contractors who get paid per event, paid per game, and um, you know it, it's just hard to think for them because we don't really know when all this is going to come back. We don't really know when. It's not like you can go out and get a job nowadays, right, yeah. Roger, to to supplement that that income. So you just you really feel for again the student athletes, but you also feel for from a broadcaster perspective, you know, the independent contractors, the freelancers, this is really hitting them really, really hard and and it's a tough time, but we'll get through it. You know? we, we certainly will. And again, there's no way you can really plan for what happened. Um, and, you know, I, I've looked at the kind of freelance model before. If I can keep moving up in TV and you just it is a game by game basis. And, uh, you know, if you're fortunate to get a lot of games scheduled, that's a great thing. And you're able to stay busy and uh, make some good money and continue to rise through the business. But uh, it is tough when you look at how many games just in an instant got canceled like that. And uh, again, yeah, I think you said it perfectly. Hopefully when all of this comes back, there's going to be more than enough uh, work to go around. Uh, it's just still a little crazy to think about round three of the Masters up against a college yeah. football Saturday. I think Alabama is lucky. I think they're playing UT Martin that day. I don't know who the Gators have coming up on mm-hmm. that day, but uh, uh, I saw an interview with Jim Nance where he said, I'll definitely be at Augusta. I'll uh, miss one of those NFL games. You can't games. miss that. <laughs> That's coming up. Uh, but this is a show called Broadcaster Hour. Uh, when we're live on our YouTube channel as we're really starting this up. Today's episode, uh, No Guess other than Kyle and I just talking and uh, kind of introducing you to what we hope to do with this show. Uh, we're really trying to just fill the void. As we said, we had so much work lined up for April and May. Uh, we just really don't know what to do. And I've been able to do a lot of uh, these similar interviews with a lot of Crimson Tide people for the Crimson Tide Sports Network. But I uh, wanted to carve out a time just once a week where Kyle and I could get together and then hopefully have some guests join us as well to really talk about the play-by-play business. And there are so many great resources out there, so many great podcasts that already exist. The Play-by-Play cast by Joel Gadet, Say the Damn Score with Logan Anderson, and then the voice behind the voice uh, with Sean Aronson, the voice of the St. Paul Saints. All three of those shows are excellent. If you're a young play-by-play broadcaster watching this, and that's really our target audience is college-age students, uh, men and women just trying to get into the business, you need to listen back to a lot of those interviews because they will give you so much insight. And what we hope to do here is just have you know a live conversation, uh, talk about the news, whatever's going on, and then bring on a lot of those guests that have been on those great platforms as well to just share what they're doing during this time without sports, and then really dive in to the craft of the business. Because Kyle, if there's anything that you and I like to talk about, it's play by play and how to do it. Yeah, we're uh, we're what you call nerds. We're, we're play <laughs> no by <doubt>. play nerds. <laughs> Every time that me and Roger get together, whether it's in Gainesville, whether it's in Tuscaloosa, we always carve out time to just sit and talk about the business. And I think we have a we have a similar mindset. Even going back to the people that don't know. Roger and me, besides us being SEC broadcasters, we have a history of in Jacksonville with the Jacksonville Suns. Um, <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't the best year on the field, but we had a lot of fun in the booth. Uh, we had a lot of fun in the booth. You were a year removed from a Southern League championship. Here I came. Bad luck, Crooks was in the mix, <laughs> and everything just uh, didn't go well. But we had a lot of fun in the broadcast booth, and that's where I first met Roger. 
um, through Mick Gillespie, who's the the double A voice of the Cubs, Tennessee Smokies, and um, we had a lot of fun then. Um, but we have a lot of stories that maybe we can get to later in other podcasts just about our time in minor league baseball. But this is also too, Roger. Yesterday, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was supposed to be opening day for for, for minor, minor league baseball, baseball. and yeah. for you, you're you're out of it for the first time, and and what a crazy year to to step out of minor league baseball because now there is no baseball. But um, for you, spending such a long time in Jacksonville with the Suns, now the Jumbo Shrimp, um, seeing that brand develop, and and that's a big part of minor league baseball and being a broadcaster in minor league baseball. But you have to feel, too, I mentioned the the freelancers and independent contractors, but minor league broadcasters, man, they, they wait all year round to get that opportunity to call baseball. And April 9th yesterday was opening day, and... There's no baseball. You wonder when minor leagues is going to start up again. I just and you see that the Jeff Pass an article, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, baseball in May. That's just you're you're not going to have this bubble. Right. It's just not going to work. It's it's uh, you want to have positive thoughts that baseball is going to come back sooner rather than later. But in the grand scheme of things, should we really be trying that? Are broadcasters even going to travel for for that that bubble city in in May? It just seems too soon. Yeah, it seems too soon. I think it's a little too soon and just all the variables that you open yourself up to with hotel workers, ballpark staff that are yeah. not going to have the luxury of being quarantined in their own rooms like the players. I mean, the support staffs for baseball, especially in the major leagues, are just so large. So it's I, I, I have a tough time seeing that, like you said, being pulled off in May, maybe a little bit later would be good. But you mentioned minor league baseball, um, and this is the first year I haven't been in minor league baseball after being mm-hmm. in it in 12 years, uh, starting back in 2008 uh, with my hometown team, the Kingsport Mets, uh, and then with the Tennessee Smokies, and with Jacksonville for a long time in the Southern League. Uh, I am really concerned about minor league baseball. I was going into the year anyway with uh, the contraction plan that was put forth that would eliminate eliminate the first team that I ever worked with, Kingsport Mets, and eliminate the entire Appalachian League. Um, But the reason I'm so concerned about minor league baseball during this time is the luxury that college sports, pro sports have, television contracts that bring in so much money. Minor league baseball doesn't have that. It is all about how many fans can you get into the gates and watching and spending money, uh, you know, concessions, merchandise, things like that. So uh, definitely thinking for all my friends, you know, some of my best friends in the entire world are minor league baseball broadcasters. And I hope once we get through this, the business can get back to normal as much as possible because, you know, let's face it, I mean, teams budget for about 65 home games a year. They play 70 usually, especially in the Southern League, but they always kind of budget for five rainouts or so. Um, it's going to look a lot different, and I hope that there's still a very important place for broadcasting with that because it is a link to the fans that I think is badly needed. And you, they're kind of run like small businesses, mm-hmm. right, minor league baseball? And, I mean, a lot of the conversation is, are there major league uh, teams that can handle a season with no baseball financially. Now, minor league teams, it, it's hard to think that they could really handle it financially. But again, I, I hope that we get through this sooner rather than later. And maybe we see some baseball in late July, maybe August. I think that's the, the closest that maybe we can get to thinking that. I just don't think we're going to see it in May. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know much about health, public health, but uh, I just don't see us playing in June either, especially with, like you said, a big part of the revenue for minor league baseball is the fan experience, the fan going to the game, concessions, that's really merchandise, all, it, you all know, that. I mean, you know, and you, you don't have that. Yeah, you well, don't have that. You don't have the big groups coming. You know, that's where they make a lot of money as well is through group sales and advertising. Uh, I just hope there's a good solution on the way. And I know they have great leadership, and I think it's going to get sorted out as time goes by. But that's another part of this is just to, when, trying to work your way out of this pandemic. And you got to have no travel restrictions. You've got to be able to have gatherings of more than 50 100 people he's got to get into the thousands for it all to work that's part of what is making this time yeah. just so unpredictable and that's why i just i don't see at least for now maybe that could change 90,000 people in a stadium for an sec football saturday i mean yeah. it's it's hard to really think that that can even happen in early september at this point so but from the minor league perspective too because you were in the minors for a long time and and i was in it only for for one year I was the number two to Roger in Jacksonville with the double A, the Marlins affiliate. Um, And I I have the utmost respect for people that work in minor league baseball because it's 
it's such a it's such a grind. It's it's unlike anything that I experienced in this business. Um, part of the reason why is you know my car broke down. I had to move <laughs> and and all that stuff. But it it. it it's a lesson for young broadcasters, right? If you want to get into this business, you're not going to make a, a ton of money, especially in minor league baseball early on. Um, you're, you're going to have to find ways to, to, you know, scrape enough together to, to pay rent and, and find a place to live. And it, uh, it certainly is a tough thing, to, especially the travel in minor league baseball. You're not flying anywhere. You, you have to bus. I know, I think the closest road trip in Jacksonville was what six hours. Pensacola, yeah, Pensacola. was the closest if place. If we had a time change coming back from Pensacola to Jacksonville, it was six hours. It was about five going the other way. But as I've told people before, whether you're getting there at four in the morning, seven in the morning, eight in the morning, there's not a yeah. lot of difference. I mean, I always like to get to a new city while the sun was down. Yeah. Uh, getting to a place where the sun was up and you have to play that night, that would be a little tough. But, but yeah, the, travel is a grind and it's not just, oh, you're tired for that one night, you don't get much sleep on the bus. It kind of resets the whole week. I mean, you'd see me just a zombie for a week after some of our road trips. And we had... Again, back to some, some of the memories we had mm -hmm. in Jacksonville. We had a 20-game homestand. For those that have not yeah. been a part of minor <laughs> league baseball, homestands for broadcasters are a lot tougher because you're just dealing with more things. You're, you're helping out the rest of the staff. And to have a 20-game homestand like we did, including a Marlins exhibition. Yeah, that's that how you was, started in minor league baseball. <laughs> that was my first month in minor league baseball. And that's why I just have crazy amounts of respect for people that grind it out that continue to want to chase that dream by going through that minor league baseball route it's 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 almost like the broadcasting part of it from a team's perspective is the last thing on the list they want to make sure that if you're in sales that you're you're selling if you're you're helping out with you know group sales and, and touring people around the ballpark to to help you know sell sweets or you know the media side of it so you're not just broadcasting the game you're you're doing stat packs you're, you're updating you're creating game notes you're doing the media guide um you're doing lineups you're doing so many other things that are just that have nothing to do with the broadcast side of it being on the air putting the headset on that that was a job that i'm so grateful that i had because it taught me how to grind it taught me how to manage my time um me personally i kind of have like that obsessive compulsive kind of nature to me so if something wasn't done the night before uh like if i didn't have my game notes done my stat pack done my um you know lineups or like the lineup graphic done and all that stuff it just for me it was it was tough because I didn't know how to manage my time. I was just trying to overload myself until, and like, you just learn so much about yourself when you're minor league baseball because it's like if you had a bad broadcast, and I had plenty of them that year, you just you have to think, well, I got like 130 of these yeah. left, so if I'm going to sit here and I'm going to pout now, I got to get ready for tomorrow. So it's like you have that quick amnesia of a bad broadcast because you 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 have. 17 days straight mm -hmm. where you're going to be on the air that was the best part of minor league baseball is you know college sports a little bit different if you have a bad broadcast you, you can have three or four days to stew on it right but minor league baseball baseball in general you are it's you got to forget about it because you got a game in less than 24 hours and you got to get ready to go yeah, and that kind of takes me to where I wanted to go next with this. Uh, you know, in the future, we're going to have a lot of guests. We're going to be asking them about their path and uh, what they, you know, what's important to them, what was their spark to get in the business. But for this introduction episode, I think this is a really good time for Kyle and I to both share our stories. Uh, and so, Kyle, we'll start with you. Uh, first of all, what was the spark? Why did you want to go into this? Uh, I'd have to probably go back to when I was 10 or 12 years old. Watching the, the Nets teams, the Jason Kidd, um, Keith Van Horn, uh, my favorite broadcaster growing up was Ian Eagle. Originally, though, I thought I wanted to get into sports talk radio. So Mike and the Mad Dog, Chris Russo, Mike Francesa in New York City on WFAN, I would listen to them about, I don't know, the full five and a half hours a day, just becoming a, a sports nerd. And then that slowly dissipated into play-by-play -play where I was just – learning more about the business. And again, Ian Eagle was one of the first guys that I listened to and I'd be like, I just love listening to this guy. And then I became a nerd for the industry and it got to the point where I didn't really care at times much about 
the games I was watching, but how they were being attacked from a broadcasting perspective at a younger age. So then I started out, I went to high school. I didn't do much in broadcasting. Uh, I was kind of a late bloomer probably when it came to that. Um, so I played sports in high school, but then I went to a county college um, where I hosted a sports talk radio show. And um, there, I it was kind of like a Mike and the Mad Dog imitation. That's what I thought I wanted to be. I thought I wanted to be a sports talk radio host. And then I realized, like, most callers, they, they know they know more than you. Yeah. <laughs> so you're gonna you're just gonna be found out right away. It's probably not gonna work. It could be a nice side gig later in life, but play by play is the way that I wanted to go. And in junior college, there were no opportunities to do play by play. So I was searching around, like, do I want to go to Syracuse? That was that was the, the big school, right? And I was thinking at first, like, yeah, that's that's where I want to go. I want to I want to be a Syracuse guy. And then I'm looking around the area, seeing like, well, you know what? Um, I want to go somewhere because I only got two years left after junior college. I want to go somewhere where I know I'm going to get immediate reps right away. So there's a small university about 15 minutes from where I live, William Patterson University. For those that know Kevin Burkhart. He went to William Patterson University. We keep in touch to this day. He's an outstanding broadcaster, NFL on Fox. And I, I just kind of studied the university. Uh, I studied the radio station. They've, they've won and they continue to win national awards for their college radio station. They had a fully functioning sports program where they had a morning sports talk show. They had supplementary sports talk radio shows. And they did four sports where they did just about every game. They did football, basketball, baseball, softball. So I said to myself, like, if I go in there and I impress, I can get on the air right away and I can really make the most of my junior and senior years of college. So I said, you know, Syracuse is great. It's a pipe dream. But now I'm only working with two years and there's a good chance I don't get a ton of time on the air. So then I went to William Patterson. Uh, I hosted the morning. I should say I produced the morning sports talk show right away. Um, it was a ton of fun, uh, six to nine AM every Tuesday and really just learned a lot about how to be on the air and how to just kind of talk into an open mic. You know, it's one thing to just talk in general, but once that red light comes on to just learn how to control your nerves, learn how to formulate a sentence on the air and just, you, you know, sports, learn how to talk it. And then I got that first taste of doing play by play live in the air. And then that was that was it for me. And then the following year, my senior year, I, I left enough of an impression to be the sports director there. So I essentially did all the sports, play-by-play, -play, sports talk radio, um, and uh, became the sports director of the radio station. And from there, I did high school sports, so post-graduation, high school sports, D3, D2, football, basketball, baseball, softball, really anything under the sun locally in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, but I got to a point in my career, Roger, where I think we all do, where you're like, uh, and I had two, I don't want to forget 2015, that was my first big break, was mm -hmm. through you. Um, first through Justin Shackle, who's uh, the scoreboard host of the New York Yankees, used to work in the Southern League. I knew somebody, and it's just funny how this business work at, works out. I knew somebody at the gym who knew Justin, who knew Mick <laughs> I Gillespie, never knew that. I never knew the, uh, knew the gym you. connection so, to Justin. Wow. So the, the gym connection, I talked to him a couple weeks ago. He's the reason that my career got jump-started. And it's, it's just funny how things work. And then I was connected to you. And I was in AA. Um, my second year, now first year out of college, and um, learned a lot about myself. Like I said, that was a that was a tough summer for me, just making sure that one, make uh, time management, like I said, but getting better on the air, getting to a point and realizing I'm not as good as I thought I was. And I think a lot of people get that pretty early on. You get that rude awakening. So then I go back home, you know, the minor league team, Jacksonville, they have a bit of a shift in who's running the team. So I don't come back to Jacksonville, do a lot of high school stuff, a lot of D3, D2 stuff, just kind of holding on to the dream, right? Uh, just trying to find ways to do games, uh, make money here and there, work on the side. And um, you kind of get to the point, right, where you're, you're saying to yourself, is this, is this dream really going to amount to anything? It's not. It doesn't feel like I'm going anywhere. I feel like I'm stuck in quicksand. And a lot of people I know are in that situation where they feel like they're stuck. And that was me. And then out of nowhere, I, I see this Florida job pop up on STAA. Uh, I applied for it, had about three rounds of interviews, went down 
came down here to Gainesville, had about like a seven hour day interviewing with everybody from administration to sports information to coaches. And uh, I got the job and I've been here ever since. So this is my third year. I guess I wrapped up already my third year here in Gainesville uh, from the depths of not really knowing uh, what what, what was going to happen with my career to to being here. And uh, now I do soccer um, women's basketball, softball, and I fill in on men's basketball here. And I just think of the, you know, my, my first men's basketball game I ever did, Roger, was Florida Auburn, was a sold out <laughs> arena. It was a nine o'clock SEC network game. Uh, a year almost to the day before, I was calling a Division two men's basketball game with 50 people in the <laughs> arena. It's just, you, you have to, if you really want to do this, you have to find ways to, to fight through it. And I'm, I'm very lucky, very lucky to be here, Roger. Well, you've got a lot of talent, and I think persistence is the main thing that has helped you, of course, get to where you are. And basically anybody I see, whether it's a network broadcaster, voice of a a major college program, uh, you know, a lot of our friends at minor league baseball, it's all about persistence. And it's all about uh, finding ways to grind and really come up through the industry uh, because you can move up if you keep trying. There's just a part of it that is if you show up, you do a good job, you are going to move up. But you've got to have a little more than just that uh, to be able to stand out. And you have to have the ability to critique yourself and get better. Or otherwise, you're going to sound exactly the same as you did whenever you first got on that mic, whether it was you doing your sports talk show in college. For me, it was uh, starting with PA announcing in high school and then just a little bit of play-by-play in my freshman and sophomore years before I really started to uh, kind of make those adjustments and try to sound a lot better. Uh, I'll go through my journey uh, real quickly to kind of catch everyone up to speed on what I've been doing. Um, From Kingsport, Tennessee, where I mentioned we had a minor league team, the Kingsport Mets, but for me it was just, you know, I kind of liked it as a kid. I grew up a big Chicago Cubs fan and my family and I would go to Chicago uh, each and every year to see the Cubs play and with that uh, they were on WGN every single day in our house in Tennessee uh, getting to listen to Harry Carey and Steve Stone and Harry was just a larger than life personality and uh, he was just so much fun. He made a bad Cubs teams. Just so much fun yeah. uh, to listen to. That, that's what I love so much about Harry and you know I remember in 1994 was his 50th year broadcasting Major League Baseball. So WGN did a special called When Harry Met Baseball, and Bob Costas interviewed Harry at Wrigley Field, and it was a whole retrospective on his life and career. And my family uh, recorded it, thank goodness, on a VHS tape, and it was just one of those early inklings that, oh, wait a second, this could be a job. And then a few years later, I started to get big into uh, my Tennessee football fandom and the voice of the Vols, a legend named John Ward. He retired that year, same year that Harry Carey passed away. So all throughout that 1998 year when I was 10 years old, which is a pretty big year, you know, that's, you know, you get an extra digit added to your age and you're starting to, you're having conversations with adults, you're just really starting to grow up at that time. Um, I just saw retrospective tribute over and over again to John Ward and Harry Carey. And, you know, Harry can always seem like, you know, this guy in Chicago that's on national television, kind of no one can do that. That's kind of what I thought at the time. But with John Ward, it was a little different because he was the play-by-play voice of the University of Tennessee, where my dad went to school. And then he also went to school there. So, and that's, you know, an hour and a half down the road. So that was kind of the spark for me. And I've had myriad of interest in a lot of other things. But in high school, I really started to think that sports would be the answer. Um, so I went to the University of Tennessee after doing a little bit of PA announcing in high school. That was basically, you know, we didn't have any of the things. We, if we had Facebook back then, Kyle, I probably would have been, you know, the uh, Facebook Live voice yeah. of every Dobbins Bennett sport. But <laughs> at the time, we really didn't have that. Uh, so I went to Tennessee and started, you know, went and met with Bob Kessling, the voice of the Vols, and kind of sat down and said, I'll do anything you want. I just want to get in this business somehow. And when I volunteered that, I thought, okay, they're going to let me set up tables for the pregame show outside the stadium. I'll get to, you know, carry camera bags and stuff like that. I thought that's all he would kind of let me do. But what he let me do was uh, kind of volunteer in the internet communications office, which happened to be one of the only departments at that time uh, in the Tennessee Athletic Department that was both men's and women's sports. At the time, Tennessee had a split uh, men's and women's athletic departments. So started with kind of a weekly podcast, uh, 
called This Week in Lady Fall Land, where I learned how to write a script, voice it, and try to lose my awful East Tennessee accent that I had at the time. Um, and that was a struggle. I mean, even, you know, think about it when you first started, Kyle. 90 second report like that, it took forever to voice because there were flubs. Yeah. There were just, you're so nervous being on a mic for the first time. You know, you think back to stuff like that, it was so hard. But you mm-hmm. have to take those early steps, I feel like, and I'm sure you can relate. Oh, yeah. I had a big Jersey accent, Roger. <laughs> big Jersey accent. It's uh, it's it's slowly, it's it's salted away throughout the years. But uh, hopefully I don't get a, a southern accent. But, uh, yeah, no more, no more Jersey accent <laughs> anymore. Yeah, so I started to lose it kind of by doing that. And then uh, one of the cool things we got to do as well is uh, this was the fall of 2006. Uh, Tennessee was starting to stream. At that point, the only sport we did that my freshman year was volleyball. Um, so we were able to set up a stream. It's actually kind of similar to what we're doing right now, if you think about it, except uh, we had a kid camera on a tripod going into this malt box or whatever that would connect it uh, to the computer and we were streaming off a laptop with one mic that was handheld and I was able to do play by play for early Tennessee volleyball streaming which is crazy now because it was me by myself I had to do all of it plus call the game Mm -hmm. and now it's like an eight camera shoot for the SEC network and now it's in Thompson Bowling Arena much nicer than Stokely Center at the time. But that's where I started uh, with play-by-play, and I was not very good. I was fired later that year, basically, from doing volleyball, or they just kind of took it away from me because the coaches heard that I didn't really know much about volleyball. And, you know, (laughs) when I asked the SID right before the first game, I'm like, all right, I just have one other question. What's a libero? Which is not even the correct way to say it. <laughs> I had no clue. But you kind of figured out the rhythms. And then uh, the next year, as I was a sophomore, it was still kind of my job to set up the stream. And for a while, they were like, okay, we're just not going to have an announcer. Well, I went rogue, as I'm prone to do, and turned on the mic and just started doing it. And I would do these post game interviews with the volleyball coach for the website. And he goes, Did you call the LSU match? And I got wide eyed. I was like, yeah, I did. He's like, yeah, we, we all watched the replay. That was really good. So that oh, was kind of the yeah, first thing that was like, okay, maybe I'm starting to make progress. And, you know, even that freshman year, we had an issue getting the Vol Network radio feed for baseball. So I did – that was my first uh, baseball play-by-play I got to do was Tennessee against Georgia, a weekend SEC series, again, on a small little screen, mm-hmm. uh, no crowd mic, just me talking into a mic, but – called a home run that sounded pretty good and my uh, boss at the time heard it and thought all right you got a future in this but now you got to work now you got to really learn what it's going to be like so uh, kind of from there just to Tennessee was a ton of mainly reporting because everything with the school was kind of to help you become like a tv anchor or a local news reporter Um, so I did all that stuff did a lot of writing with the athletic department we did you know a lot of highlight packages and stuff like that Uh, and then slowly but surely added other sports like soccer, softball, was able to do a little bit more baseball uh, before I became part of the uh, baseball broadcast crew my senior year, uh, and then started doing minor league baseball. Uh, 2008 with Kingsport Mets, uh, we set up a webcast uh, through MILB.com, and that was the first way to start to do play-by-play each and every day, and I kind of learned that season in the Appalachian League about the grind, and uh, like you said, you're not very good. But you, you learn, yeah. You learn, you learn quickly. You kind of need to see a double play. You need to see a double in the gap. You need to see some big strikeouts. You need to learn how to call the pitches as they come in. And uh, we'll kind of get deep in the weeds in future episodes on what we like in individual sports. But uh, that was how it started in minor league baseball with Kingsport Mets. That led to me working with uh, Mick Gillespie and Darren Hedrick uh, with the Tennessee Smokies as kind of the number three broadcaster for the 09 season. Um, and then the next year worked with Mick as well as as his number two finally got to do some play-by-play on a regular basis during home games and he he was a great teacher he was someone that would uh, sit with me you know during the game in between innings he'd give me feedback and he made me a lot better and we had a lot of these type conversations too where we just talked about broadcasting for a long time and uh, through his help and some connections in the league ended up in Jacksonville in 2011 as the voice of the Jacksonville Suns double-a affiliate of the Florida Marlins 
at the baseball grounds of Jacksonville. Now they're they're the Jumbo Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp, Double A of the Miami Marlins, and they play at one to one Financial Ballpark. That's how much. That's what the name of the the ballpark is now, correct? So <laughs> yes. no more baseball grounds in no Jacksonville. No more baseball anymore. grounds. It's still Bragan Field. The playing surface still right. named after the uh, Bragan family, but uh, it's amazing how things change. And you know, even then, first year out of college, twenty eleven. Got a lead play-by-play job in a huge NFL market uh, in Jacksonville. I thought that was the biggest break of biggest breaks, and it was a really good one. But as Kyle said, the grind and having to travel, and then at that point I didn't have you know someone to help me like Kyle or even help on the media relations side. Uh, it was too much, and that summer was an absolute struggle, and ended up not going back in 2012. So what I did was I was still doing some college football, Maryville College, D3 school. I was doing their football, men's basketball, women's basketball on web streams. Um, But went back home and got uh, the job to be the number two broadcaster for University of Tennessee Baseball and worked with uh, one of my good friends, John Wilkerson, who's been the baseball voice since the 90s for Tennessee Baseball. And it was that spring where everything clicked because I was able to really – take a step back from everything I had done because one of the things I had done in that first year in Jacksonville, I developed a lot of bad habits and I wasn't listening to myself enough and I wasn't getting feedback from other people. It was just kind of had this, you know, headstrong vision of, okay, here's who I am. I'm going to do it. You can't change me. If I have a home run call that's bad, so what? It's my signature home run call. We know now you don't need a signature home run call. If one happens, great. It's got to be organic. It can't be as uh, the home run call I had at the time. It's as good as gone. <laughs> Terrible. Way too many <laughs> syllables. And of course it's gone. It's as good as gone because it is gone. See, that's that's what t- that's what's <laughs> tough though with signature home run calls though. And I don't want to step in your story, but like No, you're good. The timing of say like a wall scraper, right? Yeah. So you if you know you're going to get into that, you have to really make sure that it's gone. So if that's that's the one thing about signature home run calls, if you're going to have one, is sometimes you may be stuck where you're sitting there anticipating, all right, is this ball going to get out? Because if it is, I got to get into my signature home run call. But if I it's know. a wall scraper, it's really hard to – you have to like shoehorn it in at yeah. the end and it sounds awkward. Yeah, and that's why unless you're able to come up with something brilliant that you know the greats of this business have done – don't try to do it, especially right. if you're a young broadcaster. Just call everyone individually. And there are even guys that have done it a million years that call every home run a different way. I think that's kind of the way I've done it. I know yeah. you've done similar. Don't try to control. Any time you contrive something in this business, it's bad. If it happens naturally, unscripted, go for it. But mm-hmm. And if people like it, if you stu- if get feedback from it, you know, now social media is kind of the main way you get feedback on certain things. That can be okay if people are genuinely like it. But if they're making fun of it, you also kind of <laughs> yeah. have that awareness and be like, I, I okay, tend to this is lean, probably not good. Probably like you, I tend to lean more towards like national mm-hmm. broadcasters. So even though like... You know, Joe Davis, the voice of the Dodgers, but he's, for me, I, he has a national sound. Mm-hmm. He is, he's on Fox, he's a national guy. I listen to somebody like John Shambi. That's, that like, the national sound is something where it's not too, like you said, contrived or, and like, I don't want to knock people that do do that. If it works for you, great. But for me personally, and I, I think probably for you too, is I like to go for more of, say, a, a national, neutral kind of, now, I'm on the Gator Sports Network. Mm-hmm. You're on the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Right. So right away, you're not 50-50. You're not really paid to be 50-50, but I'm not 100-0 to zero either, you know, in yeah. terms of how I call the game. Yeah, and I never used the word we. When, and that was even no. with Jacksonville where, you know, I was literally – and I'm, to kind of wrap up the story, I was able to get back to Jacksonville a year later. The Bregan family brought me back after I kind of took a step back in 2012, got better with Tennessee baseball, still worked with Mick a little bit with the Smokies, so I still had some pro baseball innings and ended up getting the job back and was there up until this February when I left to become full-time here at Alabama. Um, But yeah, that's one of the big things you learn is not to get into full homer mode because there will be people that uh, have these viral calls that make you know sports center top 10 going nuts and screaming their screaming. lungs out yeah, yeah and it's just that's not broadcasting to me because if you're listening to it live you can't tell what's really going on and that's always what's been most important to me and i mentioned my the two broadcasters when i was growing up that had the biggest effect on me 
Harry Carey and John Ward, I've always tried to be kind of a mixture of both of them where Harry was a lot of fun, big showman, you know, he would have some phrases and stuff, but it was just bigger in life. You'd love being around him. John Ward was kind of that red barber cloth where he was very mm-hmm. much of a taskmaster, accuracy, fairness above all, but he also had a knack for saying the perfect thing at the perfect time to make plays really uh, legendary and memorable. So, you know, those are two guys I've really studied and tried to be part of. But yeah, I've never gotten into the fact of like, oh, we got to get a base hit here, you know. You know, sometimes I'd say we when it referred to Jacksonville and in interviews in a setting like this, but never on the air because again, once you're doing that, I just think it colors how people view you. And if you say anything about officials or anything like that, it's easy to be labeled a homer, and that's something I never want to be. You know, exactly. And and when you say if you were to say we on a broadcast, it's not like you're getting a base hit. Yeah, it's not like you're fielding a ball in the hole. Um, you're not doing anything to affect the outcome of the game. So in a way, you're a reporter you're reporting what's going on you're describing what's going on and it's some type and here's the difference too uh again i don't want to cut in cut into your story but i'll just say this um from a college perspective it gets harder and harder when you travel with teams to Mm -hmm. not become emotionally attached to the program so you know the coach you know i have great relationships with the coaches good relationships with the student athletes so if if I'm going to sit here and tell you that I'm not rooting for them in a way. I mean, that's just not true. I mean, I want them to do well. I want them to win. But there has to be some sort of bar that you broadcast to. And for me, that's more of a network neutral side with that little twist, say 60-40, I think is the good balance for, say, a hometown radio network where you're going to get pretty amped up for a big Gator play. But if we're playing Alabama and Alabama hits a game winning shot, I'm going to give it its justice. Yeah. And that's the thing. And I think and I, I've seen calls of yours where you've done um, Alabama games, but you've, you've given the, the, the pop to the, the necessary pop to the other team. And you don't have to continue to, to scream about it. But I think in that moment, you have to you still have to give it some juice, even if it's the road team. Yeah, you always do because, again, you're just trying to capture the moment. And, you know, for us, you know, we're still kind of up and comers and we're maybe we're kind of in the middle right now of our careers, still looking for that next huge break. But still, we've had some good breaks along the way to get to some really good jobs, you know, and really good exposure with both Alabama, Florida, SEC Network Plus, uh, some other areas as well. Um, but, yeah, you always you just want to do the moment justice. And that's why we became sportscasters. Um, so I think that's kind of the most important thing to keep in mind there. Uh, just to wrap up my kind of journey uh, with college sports, I had done Division three football, like I mentioned at Maryville College, a couple years at Carson Newman, um, working alongside Adam Cavalier, who was the first ever winner of the Jim Nance Award, still does a great job uh, for Carson Newman Athletics. Uh, and then uh, through Mick, he was the women's basketball broadcaster at Alabama. I filled in for him a lot, and then when he stepped away from that role, uh, I stepped in and I uh, just wrapped up year number six doing that uh, with Alabama. So that's... Uh, kind of what led me here and I got to fill in for Chris Stewart last year while he was uh, sick and we're fortunate that Chris is a lot better but got to step into his role in football and men's basketball for the first half of the year as well so that's what uh, kind of led me to this point and now Kyle all of a sudden no games to announce. Yeah and it's cool though because now we're hosting a podcast together but to see how our careers continue to somehow intertwine whether it's minor league baseball and we kind of laugh about it now but Years later, here we are both in the SEC. You were at Alabama when I was at Jacksonville, but mm-hmm. I had gone home and I had no real connection to Florida. I think that's what kind of made this a little extra special too when I got hired because I didn't have any SEC connections at the University of Florida. The, the closest thing was me working in the state of Florida in Jacksonville for that minor league job. And m- one of my first uh, parts of that job that year was just kind of working and walking around the Florida, Florida State game at, at uh, what was the baseball grounds of Jacksonville <laughs> at that time. And just seeing the passion of college athletics, especially in this state, especially in an area like Jacksonville, and now to be a part of it and to, for the last couple of years, experience you know, SEC football Saturday, and now you're part of a broadcast team for that, which must be incredibly thrilling. I have a small role. I do, you know, interviews for the pregame show for Florida football, but even like for me, that's that's a really big deal to me. Um, it should be. It's a huge honor. And, um, and to go ahead. And 
and, and doing the, the men's basketball games mm-hmm. here at Florida, growing up watching those two national championship teams with Al Horford and Joe Kim Noah as a kid in middle school. And now here I am sitting next to Lee Humphrey, who was the, the starting guard <laughs> yeah. on that team, calling a game at UConn. It's just like you never know when your career is going to turn for the better. And But there's going to be turns in the opposite direction. You just have to, again, persistence is the word that you used. And I'll use perseverance, too. Um, you just got to find ways to to grind through it because we outlined our journeys. Nobody's journey is the same, and there's going to be um, some more more downward spirals for certain people, and there's going to be some quick uh, trajectories upward for certain people where they get to high levels fairly quickly, and that's great. Like you, you just can't sit and you know whine about it. You just got to meet. Like I said, you gotta you gotta grind it out. You gotta find ways to get better, and now's the time to f- find creative ways to to get better and here we are trying to you know help people that are listening and watching find ways to continue to 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 grow as broadcasters you know yeah that's uh, again the whole purpose of this show is just to kind of have a live conversation with two people and then we'll bring on some guests as we move forward uh, to talk about their journeys and uh what they like in the business but uh you mentioned it whether it was you uh, after your jacksonville summer ended not really being sure where to go next or even for me i'd kind of gotten some huge breaks really early on and then faced some adversity with some uh opportunities ending and just figuring out how to get back on the mic uh i think just especially for young guys watching this now and the, the key is just say yes to every opportunity because yeah. you never know what's going to lead to something else in the future and you know you and i have talked about it as well it's a small business so you better make sure you're nice to everybody because in two years they could be in the booth right next to you uh you never know what's going to happen but uh, again i think everyone wants to help each other and that's why we're starting this uh you know you can follow us on twitter at broadcaster hour on instagram there we'll uh, post some clips moving forward and we we want to hear from you. We've had uh, one comment from a good buddy. Uh, oh, I Griffin. didn't see that. Yeah, Griffin's watching. Uh, he's a big Alabama fan who helps get me a lot of clips from my SEC okay. Network Plus broadcast. But Not uh, a Gator fan, though. Not a Gator fan, okay. but I'm sure yeah. he watches. Uh, happy Good Friday to yeah. you both. Hope you guys are staying safe and healthy. We appreciate that, Griffin. And uh, we're going to be doing these live on YouTube. So if you ever have a question for us, so we certainly look forward to that. Once we have some guests lined up, we want some uh, commentary there as well because uh, this is really, again, a chance for us to learn and uh, – uh, this is something we hope to keep doing even when sports are back, you know, <laughs> to getting yeah. hopefully we're ready to on a Friday at noon be able to say, OK, Kyle's doing this this weekend. Roger's doing that. Uh, we want to get back to that. But, uh, Kyle, I think this is going to be a really fun way to kind of keep in touch and talk about the business as we do on kind of phone calls anyway and text mm-hmm. messages. But now uh, to open this up to a lot of people and especially college age kids, young broadcasters, we want to hear from you because, uh, you know, Kyle and I have done the same thing that you guys are trying to do at that same age and we want to do anything we can to help yeah i'm, I'm excited to to start this journey with you and, and you mentioned it before there are podcasts that are out there that do an outstanding job and and we're you know piggybacking off of that i know joe Claudette, uh his play-by-play cast which i listened to one of the episodes yesterday that just came out i believe it was with uh, producer mike moore mm-hmm. um uh, logan anderson say the damn score uh, sean aronson with say the um uh voice, voice behind, behind the voice, the voice yeah yeah, so uh, I listen to all three of those. Love them. Um, even you know, doing a lot of those long two-hour drives to to call a football game for twenty-five bucks, I would sit in my car and <laughs> listen to those podcasts to just get me ramped up for the game and maybe get some some last-minute uh, tweaks that I could throw in from a conversation that I heard and and put that into my broadcast. But we we hope that we can um, bring some of those same things to to young broadcasters and older broadcasters out there and. Again, comment. Uh, make sure you follow us on, on Twitter and Instagram. I know Roger's a big social media guy nowadays. I'm, I'm still working on it, trying to become. <laughs> we'll get better, you there. <laughs> trying to get a better, uh, become a better tw- uh, Twitter follow. But uh, I appreciate everybody following, everybody listening, and um, hopefully we can continue to grow this thing as we move along and uh, learn some things from each other and uh, during this time off. Yeah, no doubt. And we got another comment just as we were talking. Brandon Ross, who's a college junior, uh, appreciates doing this. Hope we're staying safe. And same goes out to everybody that's watching. But again, that's going to be our plan kind of moving forward is going to be Fridays at noon Eastern. Uh, We'll go live on here. And again, hopefully we'll have some really good guests. And so that way you can kind of hear some of their stories. Because like you mentioned, Kyle, when I listen to all these podcasts with these guys, it, it blows my mind some of the adversity they've faced. Or if the fact that 
maybe they didn't start right after college. They were in their 30s and 40s and got going and still ended up being you know, national network voices or voices of teams. I think that's going to be the common denominator is everyone's got a different story to tell, but the main thing is just persistence, perseverance. That's what's going to get it listening to critiques and getting better. And I think a couple other episodes we may do in the future, even without guests or just we'll take one sport a week and just say, okay, baseball broadcasting, what is good baseball broadcasting? What's good soccer, basketball, football, because you know, you and I have some very strong opinions and we probably differ on a lot of things as well, yeah. but it's still all in the guise of trying to make a better broadcast. Yeah. And I'm excited about those episodes. I'm excited to, to learn from some of the best that we have on here and, and their journeys. And like you said, no no journey is the same. And, and uh, with that, not everybody, the way they call a game is the same. So it's going to be a lot of fun to learn a lot of different things uh, from a lot of different people. And that's what this resource is going to be. And um, I wish that I had when I was in college all these, because mm-hmm. not a lot of these podcasts came out when I was in college and, and in high school. So, you know, for some of the younger guys and girls out there that want to get into this business to have some resources to just hear stories and to, you know, hear critiques. And I would love to sit here and critique my own work on this on this YouTube <laughs> live because that's in Roger. I'm sure you're the same yep. way. You just your your worst enemy sometimes when it comes to critiquing your stuff but i think that's a good thing in the end and um i'll bring some of that um mindset to this to this podcast video cast are we going to call it podcast or video uh, cast? you know it's a live stream we're going to get it in podcast form so hopefully okay. that's one of the things we'll do in the future is that you will be able to listen to this on your podcast apps as well but uh yeah it's just, and i just like the idea of it being live and especially with uh so many people at home right now uh we're going to try to keep these uh, live and free flowing as we can so uh kyle it's been fun man appreciate your time and we'll look forward to doing this again next week Sounds good, Roger. Let's do it again next week, Friday at noon. Friday at noon, the broadcast hour. Thanks for watching again.